Hello everyone. Uh, today we will start our discussion on logic programming paradigm. Uh, we have earlier talked about uh, the object-oriented paradigm, we talked about the uh, functional paradigm, and now we'll start the discussion on the logic paradigm. So, if we start <coughs> uh, with discussing the concept of declarative programming, what is that? Well, in our definition we say that declarative programming is a programming paradigm that expresses the logic of a computation without describing its control flow. And uh, to clarify this a bit, we can say that uh, in imperative languages like C or Pascal, and also in object-oriented languages like C++ or Java or Python, the programmer uh, has to describe the control flow in the program as well. Because a program in, in such languages is a sequence of statements that are executed in a certain order, and then the programmer uses loops to repeat for iterations and so on. So the programmer is, is indeed describing the control flow in, in such, uh, in such a, a, a programming paradigm. Here we're saying <coughs> that in the, in the declarative programming, the, it's, a, it's a programming paradigm that expresses the logic of the computation, but not the control flow. Let's, let's uh, jump here to a definition on um, Wikipedia. But it says, in, uh, in computer science, declarative programming is a programming paradigm that ex expresses the logic of a computation without describing its control flow. So I basically, this text that I, I put on the slide is, is taken from here. Uh, many languages applying this style attempt to minimize or eliminate side effects by describing what the program should accomplish rather than describing how to go about accomplishing it. So, in this paradigm, we describe what the program should do, but not how it should go about to find the solution. And this, as we talked about earlier, this is in contrast with imperative programming, in which algorith algorithms are implemented in terms of explicit steps. So we say, first you perform this uh, statement, then you perform uh, the second statement, then the third, then you jump again to the head of a loop and you repeat everything and so on. So we explicitly state what the program should do when we are programming in, in imperative programming languages. Now, what are examples of uh, declarative uh, programming uh, languages? Well, for example, database query languages, SQL. Think of SQL, how you put forth a statement in SQL. You, for example, you sec select some records from uh, the, uh, a particular table that satisfies a, a given condition. You do not specify how the records are being retrieved. It's up to the system itself, the underlying abstract machine, we can say, um, to, uh, to do the control, the way, uh, 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 the, the how part, how it finds uh, the records in question. Regular expressions are another thing. When we write regular expressions, we use a particular language and then uh, we're trying to, uh, for example, search for strings that fulfill a certain pattern. We are not uh, stating how the underlying system is supposed to find the, the, the strings that we're searching for. Functional programming and logic programming are also two examples of this uh, declarative programming paradigm. Because in functional programming, we rely on uh, recursion. We don't have this uh, 
sequence of uh, steps as we have in imperative languages. So we, in a way we are, we are expressing the logic of the computation without exactly describing how the solution is found. And this last example for logic programming is this the one that we, we, we're discussing uh, today. Now there, there's a, there's a well-known slogan by Kowalski, uh, a kind of a, 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 an equation that says algorithm is equal to logic plus control. Um, so he's basically saying that uh, when we have an algorithm, we can divide the algorithm up into two parts: the logic part and the control part. And the logic part is what must what must be done. And the control part is how the desired solution is found. And as we talked about earlier, imperative programming must consider both these components. We must, as programmers in, in uh, C or C++, uh, Java and so on, so both in imperative languages and object-oriented languages, we must specify both the logic part and the control part. Both what must be done and how uh, the solution is found. In contrast, logic programming only needs to consider the logic one. The control part is really relegated to the abstract machine, to the system that implements the, the, uh, to the logic programming language itself. Or the system that implements, actually, the system that implements the language. The system that implements the language, the interpreter, uh, takes care of the control part. Uh, and there's a, there's a certain process which is called unification, and that's something actually we will discuss later, which forms the basic uh, computational mechanism uh, of logic programming languages. Now, let's dive immediately now into one example just to try to get the feeling for what uh, uh, a logic programming uh, is all about. So let's uh, let's imagine we have this following problem. We are supposed to arrange three ones, three twos, three threes, three fours, and so on up to three nines in a list, and therefore the list will consist of twenty-seven numbers because we have nine uh, different numbers and all of them have three instances of the given number. So three times nine, nine is twenty-seven, and the constraint is that uh, for each i in this range 1 to 9, there are exactly i numbers between two successive occurrences a number i. So for example, this sequence 1, 2, 1, 8, 2, 4, 6, 2 could be part of the final solution because, uh, notice it could be a part of the final solution because this doesn't contain 27 numbers, it only contains uh, 8 numbers here. But if we look at the sequence, we have a 1 appearing, and then we can have at most, we, we need to have exactly one number between be, uh, until before we get 1 again. So we get 1, 2, 1. Well, that's fine. But if we have 2 occurring, the number 2, then we need to have 2 numbers before 2 occurs again. And that's true as well. And then when the second two appears, we need to have two numbers before the third instance of the number two occurs, and so on. So this would be a part of a solution, whereas, for example, this sequence, 1, 2, 1, 8, 2, 4, 2, 6, is not uh, a valid solution because between in the sequence 2, 4, 2, we don't have two numbers occurring between the two occurrences of 2 here. So this is not a valid uh, solution, or part of solution. Now if you think of it, uh, if you think of trying to implement a program in an imperative language or an object-oriented language, say C++, that generates uh, a valid solution, how, how would you go about that? Um, it, it's clear what we need to do if we think of the uh, the logic part, what needs to be done, but how the control part is is definitely not uh, immediately clear. How do we go about uh, solving this problem? 
Well, one crude way would be to um, generate all the possible uh, permutations of uh, these uh, 27 numbers such that there are uh, three ones and three twos and three nines and so on. And then for all those possible permutations, we could have a function that checks if a given uh, permutation is valid, that it fulfills the constraint. But then we're left with the problem of how are we supposed, how can we generate all the possible uh, 27 uh, numbers, all the all the possible permutations. So it's uh, it's uh, I mean this is not a, a very difficult, uh, not not an, not an extremely difficult problem to solve, in a in an say an object oriented language, but it's definitely not straightforward to do. Now, if we if we reason in a declarative fashion, meaning we just think about the the what part, the logic part, without thinking about how the solution is is found. Now, say okay. What what is clear is that we need a list, and let's call it LS. And this list uh, will have to contain twenty seven elements. And this is something that we can specify using a unary predicate, and let's call that predicate list of 27. Uh, unary predicate, well, unary means it takes one argument, and predicate is something, it's a, it's a special kind of a, of a uh, function, can we, we can say it's a special kind of a function that returns a boolean, true or false. So, when we send, if we think in a procedural way, when we send a list into this predicate, then the predicate will uh, return true or false. It will return true if the list is, is, is a list of 27 elements and false otherwise. So we could say that, in, uh, that the list of 27, which takes uh, one argument, which is a list, we can uh, say that the list has to have the following form here. Notice that we have bracket opens and bracket closes, which denotes a list. And then we have basically 27 elements that are, are uh, enumerated here in the list. And the underscore here basically means uh, it's a kind of a wild card. It means it doesn't really matter what element is there as long as there is some element. So I am basically saying that uh, I require the list to be a list of some 27 elements. So if I get a list, if a list is sent to this predicate uh, with only 10 elements, then this unification, which is being carried out here, will uh, fail. I'm not able to unify this ls with a list of 27 if ls only contains a list of 10 elements. So that's the first part. I have a unary predicate which uh, I call list of 27. Now what is also clear is that <coughs> the list ls will have to contain a sublist in which the number 1 appears followed by any other number uh, by another occurrence of the number 1 then and then another number, and finally a last occurrence of the number 1. So I can say, well, it looks like this. I, it has to have the number 1, and then uh, 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 then some numbers, some sequence x, and then the number 1, and then some sequence y, and, and then the number 1, and so on. Uh, so I can say, okay, it's 1, and then... Uh, uh, a wild card and then one and a wild card and one after that uh, and and this uh, so the list definitely will have to have this sublist it's clear because I'm demanding that there is uh, exactly one element between the number one and if we r reason further in this uh, we will end up with this uh, complete solution here that, for example, if we go all the way down here, that 
well, let's start at the top actually. So the solution to the problem, I get a list, uh, uh, the, the list uh, that I'm trying to generate, it has to fulfill the condition that it has, that uh, the predicate list of 27 is true. It has to have 27 elements. And then it has to contain a sublist which looks like this, one and some element, and then one and some element, and, and then some one. So this is a predicate, this sublist, that returns true if the list, the first parameter, is a sublist of the second parameter. But what is also a condition is that this, that there, there has to be a sublist that looks like this, two, then so any two numbers, then two again, and then any two numbers, and then two again. This sublist has has also to, has to be in the in the list. Uh, and remember that uh, we're requiring requiring that th there has to be three occurrences of every number. That's why we have one 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 two two two. We also need uh, a sublist a sublist that looks like this. That three has to be in the list and then some three numbers and then three again and then some three numbers and then th three finally and so on so so on continuing all the way up to nine so our final solution ls has to contain a sublist that has uh, the number nine and then some one two three four five six seven eight nine numbers occurring between and then nine again and then some nine numbers after that and then finally ends with a nine uh, so the, what we have done here, uh, uh, yes, I noticed that we have uh, uh, the definition of our predicate list of 27 is the way is similar to what we had discussed earlier. So what we have done here is to provide the what part of our uh, algorithm, the logic part. We haven't described how the solution is found. But this is indeed something that we can actually run in a logic programming language. And let me start Prolog now, even though we haven't started discussing this particular programming language. I want to just to show you that this is something that can be run. Um, so what I want to do is uh, I want to load a program that looks exactly the way that we showed here on the slide. So I used a particular syntax here, uh, consult, let me actually change, if I see if I can change the size here of the font. Okay, so consult, and then I'd use a single quote, and now I need a path to my program. I'll see if I can do this correctly. Oops, so I definitely forgot, notice I forgot the closing quote here. So let me guess if... If I copy this, let me just start over. I need that quote at the end. Right. So it was able to load this. 
maybe the, the font is a little bit too large. And it had some warning, but just let's ignore that for for now. So it was able to load the program, and now I should be able to ask for a solution. So if I do SOL, which is the name of the, we can say the main predicate here, and I say, okay, I'm going to provide you with an X, which is a variable, which is an unknown variable, and I'm asking the system to find the solution uh, that fulfills the conditions that I supplied. The conditions that I supplied uh, are part of uh, our uh, uh, sublist is, is one predicate is, that is used and list of 27 is another predicate that is used. So if I hit enter here, it shows me actually part of the solution is as x is equal to 191618257 and then it doesn't show the whole thing but if I hit W I can see the whole solution. Notice here 191 I have one number between uh, the ones here 191161 uh, I have a an a two here and then two five seven two six nine two yes that works I have a nine here and then I have one two three four five six seven eight nine numbers between the second nine that is fine I have a three here and then I have one two three numbers between the second three and one two three numbers between the uh, last three so this is one solution and I can actually hit uh, if I type in semicolon I get another solution because there's not a single solution to this problem and if I hit the semicolon again I get the third solution and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth solution and so on and how many solutions did I get? Did I get? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 so there were seven solutions to this, to this uh, problem and notice that we didn't specify how to come up, how to find these solutions. We just really uh, programmed some uh, logic, or we can think of it as constraints in this uh, in this uh, case. So. Uh, what we have provided is is nothing more than a specification that really repeats the formulation of the problem. We, we formulated really a specification that re, or a, a, a solution that, that, that uh, or, or logic that repeated the original specification of the problem. Uh, and the important characteristics of, the, of this paradigm, the logic paradigm, is precisely that the specifications are to all intents and purpose executable executable programs. We saw that. I was able to load this program and execute it. Uh, and our specification can also be read in a kind of a procedural fashion. I mean we can say okay I supply as I did here I supply the sole procedure if I think of it in a procedural way with a, a, a variable x that x is sent to the procedure list of 27 which puts the constraint on it that it has to be a list of 27 elements then that result the list of 27 elements is sent to the sublist procedure which uh, puts another constraint on it saying that uh, a part of this uh, a, a, a sublist of the that well that the list of 27 numbers has to contain a sublist that looks like this that it starts with a 9 then we have nine numbers in between and then we have the number 9 and so on but also 
that the sub uh, that the or, uh, solution of 27 numbers has to have a subplot that has eight there starts with an eight and then we have eight numbers in between and then we have the number eight again and so on so we can in a way read it in a uh, in a procedural fashion so we can say that we have a true programming language here, which allows us to express, in, in a compact and uh, sim a relatively simple fashion, programs that solve even very complex problems. I mean, this was, not a, this was not a trivial problem that we were solving here. But, is this ideal? I mean, it is powerful, but there is some trade-off here. The language pays some penalty, and that's the penalty of efficiency here. And why is that? Uh, because in in this example program, the computation performed by the language abstract machine, the underlying machine, is very complex. The interpreter, and notice that we we act we we are indeed running an interpreter. It's it's waiting for input. It's waiting for me to execute some query. The interpreter must try the various combinations of possible sublists until it finds the one that satisfies all the conditions. So if we go back to our program, we have a list of 27 numbers, then uh, the sublist uh, uh, predicates, which is actually one that we don't show here, we're just assuming that uh, it already exists, and it's actually part of the program that I loaded in, uh, the sublist um, predicate will, will indeed generate the list that has this particular format and then it will be that sublist has to be satisfied in the in all the other uh, conditions so if for example we get a sublist of this form from the very first sublist predicate that doesn't is not fulfilled with the other ones then what happens what happens is then uh, a backtracking mechanism is used so in this search process a backtracking mechanism is used, so when the computation arrives at the point at which it cannot proceed, the computation has, has, uh, that has been performed is undone, so that a decision point can be reached if it exists at which an alternative is chosen. So if you go back here, uh, Let's assume that LS has some particular format which is satisfied by the three first sublist predicates. But in the fourth one, uh, it is not satisfy, satisfied because the LS list at that point doesn't have a sublist that starts with a six and uh, then has six numbers in between and then we have the number six again and then we have six numbers in between and then finally we have six again so at that point there's no sublist in the ls list that has this particular format that means we have to backtrack and we have to basically undo all the computation that had been carried out before and we have to try another list and to see if all the uh, conditions are satisfied with that new list. So this is what is called uh, backtracking. And so an, some alternative is chosen, and but if this alternative does not exist, then the computation terminates in failure. And in general, this particular search process can have exponential complexity, and that's the that's the trade-off here, that's the penalty of efficiency.